provide great opportunity for uh, participants to share their recent knowledge, uh, research findings, and experience in chemistry, chemical processes, and engineering. Okay, so um, I'm Rabia Manisa Muhammad from UCITAS in Malaysia, and I will be your moderator for this session together with Mr. Saroni. Okay. Okay, and... Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, clear. Very clear. Clear, all right. Okay, okay. So, uh, today we will hold a session with two invited speakers. The first is Dr. Grandprix T.M. Kaja from Institute Technology Bandung. And the second is GS Dr. Nabiha Abdullah from University Malaysia. And we will have a Q&A session towards the end of this session. And if any one of the participants would like to ask questions, uh, that you would like to ask our invited speaker, you may write down the question in the chat box. And don't forget to include to which speaker you are addressing the question to. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, please allow me to introduce our first invited speaker for today, uh, Dr. Grandprix T.M. Kaja. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Grandprix T.M. Kaja, uh, is from Institute Technology Bandung and he obtained his PhD from the same institution. His research interests are in design, synthesis of functionalized porous nanostructure materials, application of functionalized porous nanostructure materials for sustainable development of energy and environmental remediation. He involved actively in research area with numerous research articles, as well as patents and research grants. Dr. Grandprix T.M. Kaja was also awarded the youngest doctorate in Indonesia in 2018. So today, he will be presenting a talk on a clearer picture of crystallization mechanism in the sustainable synthesis of zeolite. Without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Dr. Grandprix T.M. Kaja for his speech. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moderator, for uh, a kind introduction. Uh, firstly, I would, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to the organizing committee for inviting me as uh, to give invited talk in this wonderful conference. Um, and at this moment, I would like to present our recent result entitling the, uh, a clearer picture of the crystallization mechanism in the sustainable synthesis of zeolite. So, uh, what is zeolite? Uh, in macroscopic uh, world, uh, we see or we observe zeolite as a white powder, but if uh, we zoom in the structure, we will see the nano to micron size crystals. And if we go further, we will see the order, the long range order, periodical arrangement of zeolite structure. It is classified as microporous uh, crystalline aluminosilicate materials having the pore size of less than two nanometers. It is arranged by the tetrahedral units, TO4, uh, in which the T is silicon and or aluminum. It uh, possesses a very large surface area as well as acidity, since aluminum can uh, substitute the silicon, uh, resulting in the uh, negative uh, net charge, will we, which will be uh, countered by proton. So it will exhibit acid properties. Um, up to date, zeolite has fine 
has found extensive uh, area of applications. Uh, one of the most renowned application of zeolite is in the petroleum and pet petrochemicals industries as catalysts. So you can see many reaction, many chemical processes such as cracking, alkylation, uh, dehydrogenation, uh, uh, aromatics recovery, and so on and so forth. Uh, they are based on zeolite catalysis. Uh, so the common strategies for synthesizing the zeolite is through hydrothermal, hydrothermal uh, techniques in which uh, we use excessive water as solvent of course, and we will use the organic structure directing agents, so-called OSDA. So as you can see here, the OSDA is an organic structure which will act as template for the crystallization, for the formation of zeolite structure. So these two points uh, leads to three major problems in the synthesis of zeolite. First is energy consuming calcination at high temperature because we have to remove the oxalate organic molecules to fully uh, utilize the area of zeolite. So we have to perform calcination at high temperature. Second is the disposal of excess alkaline solution because when we use excessive water, we also use uh, excessive alkaline solution so we, we, we perform the synthesis of zeolite at basic condition. Uh, so we will have disposal of uh, so much waste at the end of the synthesis. And the third one is the reduced zeolite yield because in the excessive solution, there will be dissolution of the aluminum silicate precursors. So conventionally, if one synthesizes the zeolite, uh, uh, they can obtain the yield at maximum around 50 to 70 percent. Around 50 to 70 percent. Uh, in other words, they lose 50 percent to 30 percent of their products, which is uh, disadvantageous, of course. So, to uh, tackle these issues, uh, we have to develop the sustainable as well as, as, well as uh, green synthesis routes for zeolites. Uh, recently, we have just published our uh, review performed by my, written by my uh, master students uh, regarding the green synthesis of a zeolite. Uh, in this paper, we argue that at least there are four major routes for the sustainable and green synthesis of zeolite. Uh, first is solvent-free. We exclude the use of solvent. The second is the sustainable sources. We will talk about this later. Uh, the use of green mass of organ. We still use the organics, but uh, more environmentally friendly organics. And the fourth is organ free in which we completely exclude the use of organics uh, or we can combine we can combine uh, two or more of these available methods so herein I would like to uh, discuss I would like to share our result on the solvent free or SDA free synthesis of ZSM5 zeolite from rice husk. So ZSM5 zeolite is one of the most utilized zeolites in the industry. So herein we, uh, we combine three available methods, which is the, uh, the avoiding the solvent free, avoiding the use of excessive water. We exclude the use of organics. Um, by excluding the organics, we uh, perform the incorporation of seed crystals. And the fourth is we use renewable silica sources from the rice husk. We know that the rice husk uh, contains up to 15 to 28 uh, weight percent of silica. And we know Indonesia, as well as Malaysia, uh, we produce a lot of rice every year uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, waste potential of so much waste 
So we need to tackle this issue, this environmental as well as the synthetic problems. But in the solvent-free uh, synthesis, it doesn't mean that we, we completely uh, exclude the use of water since for the synthesis of zeolite, for the crystallization of zeolite, we need uh, water for uh, depolymerize the uh, silicon bones in the precursor as well as we need to condense, we need to perform the condensation reaction uh, from the depolymerized silicon bones into crystalline zeolites. So we need water, but in this work, we reduce the water into a trace amount. So in fact, in practice, we are dealing with solids, not with solution. As you can see here, um, we, I just have, uh, Sorry for the unstable internet. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Okay. Clear. Okay, so uh, we have XRD, our X-ray diffraction patterns, as well as the Fourier infrared spectroscopy. As you can see, uh, we will obtain the highly crystalline uh, zeolite at six hours. So this is uh, very fast. This is very fast crystallization because uh, conventionally, one can synthesize zeolite in the, in, in the order of days, more than seven days even. But in this uh, method, because we uh, reduce the amount of water, we can uh, increase the rate of crystallization up to six hours. And as you can see, uh, along with the synthesis time, we observe the shifting of the XRD peaks toward a lower 2 theta, which correspond to the expansion of the unit cell. Uh, moreover, the Fourier infrared spectroscopy also confirm the uh, similar observation. Uh, in this work, we also perform the detailed kinetic investigation, as you can see here. Uh, as you can see here, we follow the kinetics of the zeolite crystallization using the nonlinear Aframi uh, equation, in which we found that our crystallization followed instantaneous nucleation and 3D crystal growth. Uh, it should be noted that the crystallization of zeolite uh, consists of two major processes. Uh, first is the nucleation, and the second is the crystal growth. So herein, uh, using the nonlinear non Aframi equation, we could determine the instantaneous nucleation and 3D crystal growth. Moreover, we uh, analyze meticulously the rate of crystal growth, the rate of transition stage, as well as the second, sec, secondary uh, derivative nonlinear aframi to determine the TC, the TC uh, or, the temp, uh, or the time for uh, the maximum rate of crystallization, the VC or the rate of crystallization, and the VN2, which is the rate of transition, the rate of transition from nucleation to the crystal growth process. Moreover, we also perform uh, the crystallization at different temperatures. So we perform the synthesis of zeolite at uh, 160, 180, and 200 degrees C. As you can see, uh, here we can extract the information. We can extract the information using the Arrhenius-like equation to determine the activation energy of nucleation, the activation energy of transition stage, 
and the activation energy of crystal grout. I'm sorry, this should be the crystal grout. So as you can see, using this Arrhenius-like equation, we can determine that the activation energy of nucleation is of uh, 136 kilojoule per mole, the activation energy of transition stage is 50 kilojoule per mole, and the activation energy of crystal grout is 51 kilojoule per mole. So as you can see here, it appears from the activation energy results that nucleation will act as the rate determining step. So uh, during uh, using this uh, set of experiment, we are able to determine the type of nucleation, the type of crystal grout, as well as the calculation or determination of activation energies uh, during the whole sequence of crystallization. Uh, next, we elucidate, we perform a thoroughly el elucidation of crystallization mechanism using the transmission electron microscopy equipped with the selected area electron diffraction. As you can see, at zero hour, uh, this is amorphous. The structure is amorphous. The silica precursor from the rice husk silica, uh, they are amorphous. As you can see here, there is no distinct pattern uh, from the SAED, uh, from the electron diffraction, showing the amorphous nature. And as you can see, the, the morphology of this material is, is, some, is often called as uh, worm-like particles or, or WLPS. Uh, when we continue the heating, when we continue, we prolonging the synthesis time, as you can see, the structure here undergoes a densification. See, uh, we have a lot of voice spaces, but then in uh, at two hours, uh, we could uh, clearly observe the densification. We have few void spaces, but still amorphous, no distinct pattern on, uh, on the electron diffraction. But at four hours, see, at four, at four hours, now it even dense, it, it, it is even denser than the products at zero hour and two hours. And see, we have slightly distinct electron diffraction. We deduce this as the nucleation. And this is also, uh, and th this is also confirmed by our previous uh, kinetic investigation that the nucleation starts at around four hours. So they, uh, they, they are completing each other. When we move to the six hour, see, we have the cuboid particles. We have the cuboid particles, which confirm by the electron diffraction that it, it, it is a highly crystalline zeolite. And we move on to the eight hours and 10 hours, we could also uh, clearly see the distinct patterns showing the highly crystalline products of zeolites. Next, we, uh, we select the products at five hours. Why? Because you can see from, five hour, from four hours to six hours, there is, uh, uh, you can say, there is a gap because this is uh, random particles and then we jump into the uh, highly distinctive particles. So we choose, we select the products between four hours and six hours. We use the, pro uh, we select the products obtained at five hour for further elucidation. As you can see here, we can, we can, we can see uh, a single particles, but with distinct regions. As you can see, at one end here, we have smooth surface, we have smooth, distinctive surface, uh, while at the other end, we have a rugged surfaces. We have a rugged surfaces. 
So we uh, we choose to perform the electron diffraction measurement on four regions of the single particles. Region one, two, three, and four. As you can see, at region one, we have amorphous structure, no pattern, no electron diffraction pattern. But when we move to the uh, second region here, we will have a slightly distinct pattern showing the presence of crystalline structure. When we move to the middle regions, which is the third region, as you can see, the pattern is getting more distinctive, showing the development or showing the increase of crystallinity. Lastly, at the fourth region here, as you can see, very distinctive patterns showing the fully uh, crystalline nature of this region. So you can see we will have a nice, we will have a nice gradual transformation within a single particle. Um, and this result is remarkable because we can observe the transformation of a single particle from the amorphous structure to the poorly crystalline part or poorly crystalline region to the moderately crystalline region and lastly the fully crystalline region. So uh, we can uh, clearly observe the transformation and as you can also see the transformation should proceed within the solid phase. So the uh, so the the mechanism should follow the solid phase transition. It is not possible for the crystallization to proceed over the hours and uh, using the uh, thorough investigation, using the detailed kinetic investigation, we can determine the nucleation as the red determining step for the whole crystallization. And lastly, we have directly observed the solid phase transition within a single particle of zeolite. And we have submitted this uh, work to by Dr. Brandbrick and Fajar. So in speech, Dr. Brandbrick described the synthesis of say, SM zeolite and his insight on zeolite crystallization uh, mechanism for introduction. Again, I would like to remind all participants, we will have Q&A session towards the end of the session. And if you have any question, uh, please write down your question in the chat box. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now continuing this session and move on to our second invited speaker, T.S. Dr. Nabiha Abdullah. Okay, Dr. Nabiha Abdullah is currently a senior lecturer in UC Tati, Malaysia, and she obtained she obtained her PhD from Ye University of Japan in 2015. Her research interests are in carbon-related elements, polymer nanocomposites, and also in water and wastewater separation process. She has published numerous research articles, and she is known for her work in graphene and nanocomposites. So today, Dr. Nabiha Abdullah will be presenting her talk on graphene, 
the promising material of future. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Nabiha Binti Abdullah. Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon. Okay, um, thank you for the committee of the ICPE <clears throat> for giving us opportunity to participate in this uh, conference. Um, but um, okay, my name is Nabiha Abdullah, and today I would like to talk about uh, graphene, the promising material of our future. Okay, this I just want to show you guys where our uh, where our university is at. It's a uh, is is part of a uh, peninsula Malaysia. So probably after the COVID disappear, maybe you can uh, you guys welcome to Terengganu. Okay, <clears throat> before I proceed with uh, my slide, I would like to show you guys a video that uh, showing the sum up of my uh, presentation today. Okay, thank you everyone. So graphene is uh, actually is uh, in this carbon materials uh, group where we have graphite because graphite is actually is a raw material for the graphene and also carbon nanotube and also fullerene. Pul okay, uh, this is uh, the first isolation of graphene as a single layer. Graph Graphene was isolated for the first time using scorch tape technique by Jim and Wessler. 
So because of this discovery, uh, they have been awarded with the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics. Okay, these are some of the um, marvelous properties of the graphene. For example, like uh, we have here high specific surface area. This is a uh, very important if you want to use a uh, graphene as a filler, for example, in a polymer nanocomposite, or maybe in uh, also for super superconductor. And it has also high electron mobility, where this is a very important properties. For example, if you want to invent a, a high speed, high speed charge of the battery. Okay, these are some of the method for producing graphene. So we have here is a raw material of graphite, where we can do a micro mechanical cleavage. Micro mechanical cleavage is actually like um, uh, using scotch tape method. Okay, this is original method by Jim and Novoselov. However, if you want to use this method, you you cannot get a lot of a graphene because it is like manual uh, method. Uh, we can also use liquid phase exfoliation. Uh, using um, many types of solvent, for example, like N-methyl, N-methyl pyrolidon, NMP, or even water. However, the disadvantages of this method is uh, we only produce a small size of graphene because uh, usually uh, liquid phase exfoliation will break up the, uh, the layer of the graphene. And also we have here oxidation exfoliation where usually we use um, acid like uh, hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. <laughs> as a filler to build a component in the uh, vehicle and also touch screen because uh, the properties of graphene is uh, very thin um, so it is very suitable to do a uh, touch screen um, Okay, however, the issue with the graphene here, it is inert, which means um, difficult to react with other material. This is due to the covalent bond uh, between the carbon, between the carbon here. So it becomes um, insoluble and also inert material. So this is um, become a disadvantage to the polymer. For example, if you want to hybridize, the graphene with other polymer, then it's a uh, disadvantage if, uh, if the graphene is not soluble because it is lack of processability. So um, this is what I've done. One way to get a soluble graphene by using uh, organic polymers. You see here, this is the layers of a graphene, for example. And we attach the polymer onto the graphene layer. So this bulk of polymer will, um, will make the graphene become uh, separated from each other. And then it's, become, uh, it's easily soluble and inhibit the pi pi stacking between the layers. So how I do the modification of graphene with the polymer? So this is a graphene flex, and then we will use uh, azido group. Azido group here, this is an important group. And <clears throat> azido group uh, polycaprolactone. Okay, so after the reaction between these two material uh, at 160 degrees Celsius in nitrogen atmosphere for about 24 hours, this is how we get, this is how the polymer attached on the graphene and there's no more azido group here 
where we can see here the nitrogen attach uh, straightly onto the graphene layers. Okay, how am I going to prove the successful attachment of polymer onto the graphene? So one way is using Fourier transform. So for example, here we can see the graphene, very simple pic here. Only you can see a hydroxyl group here. And the important uh, functional group here is azido here at 2100 uh, wave number. However, after the reaction with the graphene and the polymer, the peak of azido group here disappeared. So you can see here after the attached azido group. So which means this is the, the successful attachment of polymer onto the graphene. Another proof is using transmission electron microscopy. So this is the pure graphene, where there's no attachment of polymer. You can see it's very transparent due to the thin layer of the graphene. However, after the attachment of the polymer onto the graphene, you can see the dark image of this layer. Okay, this is showing that actually the polymer is attaching on the graphene. That's why you cannot see the uh, layer of the graphene. And finally, the dispersibility of functionalized graphene. This is how we want to see whether the graphene is uh, soluble or not. So we take a sum amount of a graphene uh, functional polymer into the four solvent here, for example, this is dichloromethane and methyl pyrrolidone, methanol, and also hexane. So we can see here, this is a dark liquid. This is actually contains graphene, graphene that attach with the polymer. So this means uh, the dark color of the liquid is uh, showing the good dispersibility of the uh, graphene in uh, dichloromethane. In NMP also good and methanol is um, medium and finally for hexane is not dispersible at all in the hexane which means this is uh, not really a good solvent for this material. So for example probably if you want to add this functional uh, polymer onto the uh, sorry functional graphene on to the other polymer probably, you need to choose the polymer that can dissolve in dichloromethane or NMP so that you can mix together and the graphene and the polymer can well bonded uh, between layers so that we can uh, produce a polymer nanocomposite that is uh, with a good uh, properties. So these are some of the application of the graphene. For example, for energy storage device, it can act as a supercapacitor, supercapacitors to store large amount of energy. This is due to the um, properties, electrical properties of the graphene, where the electron can easily move uh, through the graphene. Okay, for the filter here, Usually for pure polymer, sorry, for pure graphene, the gas cannot go through the graphene actually. However, after we introduce the, um, the defect onto the graphene, defect means we add um, oxygen functional group to this graphene, then we can um, separate between carbon dioxide and also other gas. So this is very important because carbon dioxide can be used as a, a fire extinguisher or a coolant. Okay, I'm sure you guys who have a really a big fan of uh, Star Wars knows this, um, this R2D2, where R2D2 shoot out the hologram image. I think this is Leia, okay? So actually, in the real world, it is not easy to see a 3D image or hologram with, with, with your bare naked eyes without using 3D glasses. Okay? However, there's a scientist 
uh, has um, invented that glasses free 3D hologram, which means you do not need to use 3D glasses in order for you to see the 3D image. So it can create a full and pop-up 3D floating display. And also in medical application, there's a work that's been used to use graphene to help the Parkinson patient and other neurological disorders. And finally, for renewable energy, we can also use for solar cell and finally for fuel cell. As a conclusion, graphene has great uh, potential in various fields and the usage of graphene gives tremendous difference than the current technologies. And until up to now, actually, the scientists all over the world working hard to utilize the extraordinary substance practically and change it from brains to reality. So with that, I thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the informative presentation, uh, Dr. Nabiha Abdullah. Okay, the uh, talk will be enlightened on graphene and its potential application. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now I open the floor for Q&A session. If you have any question, you can ask uh, our panelists by writing it out in the chat box. Okay, so here I have one question. Okay, for uh, one question. Okay, uh, hi Dr. Grand Prix, uh, great presentation. I am Alpheus. My simple question to Dr. Grand Prix. What are the control parameters to be successful in making zeolite with high crystallinity? Thank you. Okay, that's the first question to Dr. Rebrix Tiantaja. And the second is, can you describe more on the applications of zeolite? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Moderator. Uh, thank you very much for the great question from France in Undana, in Kupang. In Kupang. Uh, I'm also from Kupang, from Sabu. Uh, hi to friends in Undana, in Kupang. So, uh, what are the control parameters to be for successful uh, crystallization of zeolite? Well, actually, there are many parameters because we are working with many variables. We have uh, uh, silic silica, we have alumina, we have uh, uh, alkaline salts, we have OSDA, we have the control of time, the control of temperature. So uh, we have many variables which result in many parameters. But uh, frankly speaking, uh, for me, there are two uh, major parameters for the successful crystallization of zeolite. First is the recipe. Okay, We need recipe. We need the correct molar uh, we, we need more uh, correct molar composition of our precursor. For example, if I want to synthesize, let's say, uh, ZSM5 zeolite. So you, if you want to uh, synthesize ZSM5, you will need the silicon to aluminum ratio above 10 because you cannot synthesize uh, ZSM5 with the silicon to aluminum ratio less than 10. You will not uh, you will not succeed in the crystallization, or for example, if you want to synthesis if you want to synthesize the Y zeolite, so Y zeolite uh, the the silicon to aluminum ratio is around four. So if you uh, if you make the recipe uh, beyond that ratio, you will not obtain the Y zeolite. So the first uh, major parameter is the recipe. And the second is the time and temperature. So if you, um, if you increase the temperature, you will have shorter uh, time. But if you work on lower temperature, consequently, you will have much longer 
uh, crystallization time. But for your information, and it should be noted, that zeolite is a metastable phase. So if you, uh, if you utilize too high temperature or too long synthesis time, you will end up in a dense silico, uh, silic aluminum silica material, which is, let's say, cristobalite, quartz, and so on. You will not uh, have the zeolite. So you need a uh, correct recipe and you will need uh, just right temperature and synthesis time. And I think for the second um, question about the application of zeolite, uh, it is not only uh, as a catalyst, yes, uh, it can be used as uh, for separation for membrane because it has uniform small uh, micropores, so it will act as molecular shift. Uh, it has also fine potential in uh, adsorption for environmental remediation as the adsorbent for heavy metal or natural organic metals and so on. And now the cutting edge, uh, the emerging cutting edge application of zeolite uh, is photonic. Uh, we can use zeolite as photonic materials, but uh, up to now, uh, the most uh, utilized application of zeolite is as catalyst. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Grandpix, uh, the Ampaja. Okay, next, uh, we move on to a question. Uh, address to Dr. Nabiha Abdullah. So, graphene has been one of the major discoveries. In your opinion, will it be feasible in the future that graphene will replace more coins of Hello, can you hear my voice? Hello? Hello? Can you please repeat, Rabi Atul? Hello? Okay, all right. So, um, the question, the question for uh, Dr. Nabiha. Okay, so I will share the slide here. Okay, can you see the slide? Mm, no. Okay, can you see the slide? Oh, uh, yes. No, you cannot see the slide? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So the uh, all right. So the question is, graphene has been one of the major discoveries in your opinion. Can it be feasible in the openness of it? Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Rabiatul. So, like any other materials that are newly discovered, we cannot use straight away. Usually, it takes time to do the research and development before we can proceed to the um, to to produce a product or to the to the final uh, for the customers. However, I believe that um, because because uh, now they are actually a uh, real actually real application for the graphene if you can search within the website so i'm sure uh, in the future if not near future in the future that uh, graphene can uh, replace uh, some of the application that need to be uh, that need to be improved uh, need to be changed uh, using graphene. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nadia. Okay, um, we have another question. 
also addressed to Dr. Nadia. So can you see the slide, everyone? Um, okay, so the question is, uh, good afternoon, my name is Putri. Uh, okay, my name is Putri, who goes to uh, Nabiha Abdullah, PhD. What are the properties of polymer that fit well to attach on graphene? Does the change the electricity properties of graphene? Okay, so that question is addressed to Dr. Nabiha Abdullah. Okay, I'll sh uh, show you the slide again. <clears throat> Uh, Rabia, can you see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Everyone, can you see? Okay. The question is, uh, what type of polymer that fits well with graphene? I'm not sure about any other polymer, but uh, in my case, uh, this is uh, still in uh, R&D purpose. I use the polymer that... Uh, with azido group because after the reaction this azido group uh, will disappear and the nitrogen here nit uh, nitrogen group will be attached onto the graphene uh, area sorry the graphene uh, layer okay for the second question will it be uh, the property will be changed or not um, <clears throat> okay, probably there must be a some changing, but based on the electronic properties, I think there's not much change because what's important is the graphene is still attached to the polymer, which means, uh, which means the I'm sure that the electrical property still uh, can be used uh, with that poly uh, with that graphene. Um, however, I'm sorry because I did not uh, I still did not uh, check whether this polymer is uh, uh, sorry this graphene is actually is uh, there's a changing in the electrical properties or not. But I'm sure uh, that is still. Uh, the properties is still there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nabiha Abdullah, for the answer. Okay, now, from uh, the Question uh, mentioning that the, the video uh, wasn't really good. Uh, in a session. Okay. Uh, thank you, sorry, Dr. Grand Prix and Kaja and TF Dr. Nabiha Abdullah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, that you found this presentation in the conference, very informative and useful. Uh, yeah, I thank you very much for your participation in this session and I hope to your participation in future. With that, thank you very much. Farewell. Bye. All right. Many thanks, uh, Ms. Rapiatul, for the great moderator. So, wow, very fruitful discussions. Once again, many thanks to our uh, moderator to, and our invited speakers. So now I will give the certificate for, uh, for appreciation to the moderator and the invited speaker. So here it is. Mm -hmm. So this is the certificate of uh, appreciation for Rafiatul Manisa Muhammad as the moderator for this breakout room. And this certificate 
is awarded to Dr. Frentlix for the invited speakers. And this certificate is uh, awarded to Dr. Nabiha Abdullah as the invited speaker here. So once again, thank you very much for joining this breakout room. So I would like to remind you once again that uh, we now close the invited session and we can go back to the main room all together. Please uh, just click leave room and everyone will directly uh, or automatically uh, go back to the main room. Goodbye. Thank you everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. So some rooms already finished the session and welcome back to the main room of Third International Conference on Chemistry, Chemical Process and Engineering 2020. And we're still waiting for another participants and also another invited speakers who haven't finished the session in their pre room. And we would like to inform you that after this we will have a and we will join for the okay. awarding announcement and also listen and join together for the closing remarks by the chief person of IC3PE, Professor Is Fatima. All right, so stay tuned in main room and don't leave the main room. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, while waiting for other participants who haven't finished the session in their 
break up no? we would like to back and please to fill the evaluation in the link that has a uh, present in the chat box of the zoom so please we uh, appreciate for your participation and we would like to back to you to fill the evaluation Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we're still waiting for another participants who haven't finished the session in the breakout room. And our committees appreciate for your participation and we beg you to fill the evaluation in the link that has presented on your screen. Once again, while waiting for another participants who haven't joined to our main Zoom, so please kindly fill the evaluation in the link of uh, presented in your screen.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so we would like to say welcome back to our main Zoom. Uh, we have done for the invited speaker session and also the oral and poster session in the breakout room. And now we would like to listen and we have uh, we would like to watch the awarding for best poster and best presenter. And now we would like to invite the chairperson to announce the best poster, best presenter, and to officially close the whole event of the third international conference on chemistry chemical process and engineering 2020. So to the one and only professor is Fatima, time is yours. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Starting from 8 a.m. in the morning, we have followed interesting talk from five keynote speakers. And in the parallel session, there are 10 invited speakers and there are more than 150 papers have been accepted to be presented in this conference, either in oral by video posting or poster presentation in the Google Classroom media. And among this presentation, we have selected the best oral presenter and the best poster. Moreover, as our appreciation to all of the participants, we also give appreciation to the most attractive and the most active participant. And here are the results from our referee team. Music, ding, 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 ding. Okay, so. The best oral presenters goes to Ray Yonson Chapang Pangan from Caraga State University, Philippines, with the ID paper number 15973. Congratulations to you, Ms. Ray Yonson Kapang Pangan. Okay, the next is the best yeah. yeah. presenters. Which goes to Mr. Mikdam Musawa from Chemistry Department, Universitas Islam Indonesia, with the ID paper of 16511. And for the participants, there are two categories. The first one is the most attractive participants, which goes to Albert Zico Johannes from Universitas Nusa Cendana with the ID paper number 15856. Okay, and then the last but not least, the active participants goes to Sylvia Madusari from Polytechnic Kelapa Sawit Citra Widya Edukasi. Okay, finally, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is the our conference is about to end, but I'm sure that all of you have been inspired by our speakers as well as from our invited speakers and there are so many information you got from the oral and also the poster presentation so uh, we hope that you enjoy the conference and for us as the committee we still have many tasks mainly to select some full papers to be published in either in proceeding or in selected journal as we inform in the website and during we wait for the agenda for uh, for the next agenda we will have the fourth IC3PE Okay. The fourth IC3PE will be conducted in Yogyakarta City, Indonesia, 
with the hope that at that time the pandemic have been recovered so we can meet in the physical conference so in the end we hope that you got the benefit during the waiting for the publication and hope to see you again in 2022 so this is the conference is officially closed Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, so thank you very much to Professor Isfatima, is the chairperson of uh, third IC three PE two thousand and twenty. And congratulations to all the presenters and participants. Give big round of applause virtually. Congratulations to chat the award from the committees. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are now coming to the end of the event, uh, which is the third international conference on chemistry, chemical process, and engineering 2020. Uh, on behalf of the host and the committees, we would like to extend our sincere of apology. So we do apology for any shortcomings of the site during the event of the third international conference of, uh, on chemistry chemical process and engineering 2020 and again once again uh, our deepest appreciation to you all to the presenters to the participants who join this event until the end of the agenda so thank you very much uh, the last but not least from me wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh see you on the next Bye. 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 Sukses Thank you very much for the committee from Yusitati, from Undana, from Untirta. We'll see you again in the next ICTP. Udeni, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Thank Fatima. You, Prof. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Suresh. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Prof. Ispatima MP. Yeah, uh, Pak Mulyadi, nice terima kasih. Sukses selalu, Pak. Sukses. See you again. Sampai jumpa 2022 insya Allah Terima kasih Pak Sunadi
Congratulations, Ray Yonson. Terima kasih banyak Prof. Is dan teman-teman di Universitas Indonesia. Terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih banyak. Sama-sama Pak. Oh iya. Terima kasih okay. untuk teman-teman di Universitas Sultan Ageng Tidariasa Banten. Teman-teman di Universitas Pat Tati Malaysia. Terima kasih banyak atas kerjasamanya. Semoga kita ini dapat selesai dan sukses. Jumpa lagi di tahun 2000 2022. Oke, okay. sukses. Pak Wijogo ketua, ketua panitia ulang tahun Ketua panitia kita ulang tahun Selamat ulang tahun Mas Yogo Salam dari Kupa Harusnya rayakan di Labuan Bajo ya Ya betul betul Labuan Bajo Merah, darah, darah itu merah jenderal.
tukang pilar pakai dasi pak kan itu lain tuh butak lagi kayak tukang takut tukang tukang pilar pakai dasi lo gila ada ada kumis dia itu kayaknya yang paling ganti tadi itu ya kalau yang lain sih nggak aku lagi di depannya nggak ganti Keluar, sih, keluar. <laughs>